Karen Boyle. She is a professor of feminist studies at Startlight since 2018, and her research has long focused on questions of violence, gender, and representation. Her CV is very long. You can we'll leave a link for you to to know her publications and her research interests. But let me just tell you you that the, her most recent book is Me Too, Weinstein and Feminism from Paul Brave. So when you want, whenever you want to start, you can start. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Thank you for inviting me to be part of today and also um, a consultant on the Uncover project. I think the work we've heard about so far this morning shows really how urgent a lot of this work remains. Um, and I'm really, there's a lot about the Uncover project I'm really excited to see. I think the emphasis on audiences is really important and also thinking about some of the production contexts. So as um, I think it was Julia mentioned, um, I'm going to be talking a bit about the book, um, The Routledge Companion to Gender, Media and Violence. And this is a sort of front cover reveal moment um, on our slide here. We think this is what the front cover will look like. Um, the book is due to be released in August this year, and it's a co-edited collection with my colleague Susan Berridge at the University of Stirling. And so through the editorial work that we've done on this collection, which includes the chapter you just heard about, we've been able to think a bit about the Portuguese case study in a broader context. And that's some of what I want to try and talk about um, with you this morning. Um, I think that the book as a whole will show, um, will lend a lot of weight to the assumptions that um, you presented at the beginning, Sophia, in terms of what are some of the assumptions underpinning Uncover. I think you'll find a lot of support for that around things like the tensions that our contributors identify between visibility in the media and survivor agency, so that visibility is not always an uncomplicatedly good thing for survivors. Um, the questions you've both flagged, I think, around whose voices are the voices that are heard in the media. And also that really important question, I think, about what or whose interests are served by media coverage of these issues. Now, this is a bit of a monster collection. There are 57 chapters. You may be relieved to know I'm not going to attempt to give you a potted summary of all 57 chapters. Um, but what I do want to do is just try and pull out a couple of key issues that I think might be helpful and relate back to what we've heard already. Um, and that's mainly going to be focusing on how we define our terms and then also thinking about the importance of context. So I just wanted to start really by acknowledging that if I can get into it, there we go. Um, but sorry, I've gone one too far. Um, by acknowledging that the Routledge Companion to Gender, Media and Violence does have a different emphasis to the Uncover project. So where Uncover is focusing on sexual violence, um, we're focusing on gender and violence quite broadly. Now, I did just want to highlight that we talk about this as gender and violence and not gender based violence. And I want to flag that at the outset because I think it's a useful reminder to those of us who are media researchers that we're not just scrutinizing the language of journalists and other media practitioners. We also need to think about our own representational practices. So actually one of the first things Susan and I do in the introduction to the book, um, our first analysis as it were, is actually to look at UN definitions of some key terms. So we look at, and the two definitions on the slide are those we look at, the UN definition of gender-based violence and also their definition of violence against women and girls. I'm not going to read these definitions, but what I do want to just pull out here are a few points. 
First of all, they define gender-based violence as being rooted in gender inequality and involving an abuse of power. And that I think is very helpful. It allows us to see the part called gender-based violence in relation to a whole structure of gender inequality. Um, one does not exist without the other. But they also point in both definitions to the greater risk to women and girls. So this is a definition that is based in gendered victimization. It does acknowledge the definition of gender-based violence acknowledges that men and boys can also be targeted. And that's what differentiates the definition of gender-based violence from the definition of violence against women. So they see violence against women and girls as part of gender-based violence, um, but not entirely synonymous with it. But why these definitions trouble us is that neither of them acknowledges who is doing the violence. So we have definitions that tell us that women or girls are disproportionately at risk in gender-based violence or a definition of violence against women and girls that is exclusively about women and girls at risk. But in both, we're looking at risk and not patterns of perpetration. And I think it's important that we ask, what are the implications of defining our terms based on victimization and risk and leaving patterns of perpetration unmarked? Now, just to be clear here, I'm not saying that all gender-based violence or all violence against women and girls is perpetrated by men. But just as the definition of gender-based violence talks about women and girls suffering disproportionately from gender-based violence, it seems striking that there's no reference to the disproportionate um, gender split, the disproportionate number of men and boys committing gender-based violence or violence against women. One of the things that concerns us, and we return to at a number of points in this collection, is that the language to talk about gendered phenomenon is often increasingly gender neutral. So we talk about gender-based violence, but that term doesn't tell us who is doing what to whom. Now, I make this point not because I think that terms like gender-based violence aren't useful, I think they are. Um, but I suppose I'm flagging this as something that we need to be alert to, what um, connections does our language enable us to identify and which disappear? Um, from, from the way we frame the issue ourselves, not just how it's framed in the media. And I've put on the slide here a couple of references which have informed the work Susan and I have done in selecting the book and the chapters for the book, and also in trying to organise the collection. And that is, first of all, Liz Kelly's really influential work from 1988 in a book called Surviving Sexual Violence, where she introduces the idea of the continuum of sexual violence. And she does that to enable us to see the connections in women's lives experiences and women's stories between different forms or different experiences of sexual violence over a lifetime. And I'm gonna come back to this term sexual violence because actually a lot of what Liz Kelly talks about within that book, um, are what we might think of as the everyday aspects of sexual assault. Um, she talks about, and, and what other theorists have really helpfully called the drip drip effect of sexual harassment, for instance, the daily nature of it, the routinized um, nature of it. And she situates women's experiences of things like rape, very clearly recognized and criminalized um, forms of sexual violence in that broader context, because she says women understand one event in relation to the other. 
more recently, I've done some work using Liz Kelly's work, which I still find hugely important. But thinking, arguing that we need to use it as a model for continuum thinking that makes us alert, not just to the connections between women's experiences, but also the connections between different forms of masculinity and other kinds of connections. For instance, how sexual violence relates to other forms of gender-based violence. Now, an edited collection, like a collaborative project, like your Uncover project, I think, lends itself really well to continuum thinking because it's so centrally about thinking across. So just one example that Susan and I talk about in the introduction is we have a number of chapters in the collection which talk about violence in the name of honour. So for instance, chapters by Aisha K. Gill, focusing on a UK context, Rahat Imran looking at films, filmmakers in Pakistan, and Ayla Matakav looking at um, child marriage in Turkey. But we also find that honour and its correlate shame emerge in other contexts in the collection that don't use the language of honour-based violence. So for instance, in a chapter on familicide by Denise Bwiton in Australia, and ideas about honour, pride and white nationalism circulate in chapters by Catherine Claire Higgins in Australia and Nikki Falkoff writing about South Africa. And we ask the question, what do we gain by putting these things together? And what we suggest is that putting these things together allows us to see connections in men's excuses for violence in the name of honour, pride, nation and more, but at the same time raise questions about the very different language typically referred to, used to refer to these acts in media and research contexts. And I think this links back to your, the point you were just making, Julia, about um, the monsterization of perpetrators and seeing the really clearly racialized dimension to that. So honor-based violence is associated with minoritized communities but when white supremacists commit acts of violence and use the language of honour to do so, we don't call that honour-based violence because that would make us have to think about whiteness and nationalism in a different kind of way. So what I want to kind of indicate here, I guess, is that we're not trying to say that one term such as gender-based violence, sexual violence, so on, is better but we want to be alert to the different work that that language can do, which is of course exactly what we ask our, our media colleagues. It's part of the reason we do this kind of analysis of the media is to ask them to be attentive to language. And here I think, you know, it's, it, it's good to turn that lens back on ourselves. And the term violence here, I think, is also worth reflecting on because it can be quite contentious in itself. Um, and I wanted to put up Alicia Milano's Me Too tweet here, because Me Too is often used now to talk about sexual violence and as kind of a real lightning rod for contemporary discussions about sexual violence. But I think it's really interesting that the original tweet uses the language of harassment and assault, not violence. And I think that becomes a useful example because a lot of the experiences shared under that hashtag were precisely that kind of everyday sexual violence that Liz Kelly talked about, but that many people struggle to define using a language of rape or sexual violence or language that might carry legalistic overtones. So I think a really useful question for us all to reflect on is what terms will enable the people we want to participate in this project to see themselves and their experiences in it. And that might be sexual violence, but it might be useful to expand that in different ways so that it's clear it includes other forms of assault. So that's how we set out the terms. I'm just gonna spend literally a couple more minutes giving you a little bit of an overview of the book. Um, it's organized into four parts. Um, the first, which is where um, the chapter we've just heard about sits, is focusing on news. 
The second on representing reality. So we've got chapters on podcasts, magazines, vlogs, documentary film and television, magazines, pornography, um, and more. The third on gender-based violence online. And then the final section focusing on feminist responses. And I think here, your project, your Uncover project, with its emphasis on the media scape, is actually echoing a lot of what we're trying to do with this collection, which is to see the relationship between news and these other media forms, and the fact that in lots of ways, those are quite porous boundaries between different media forms um, in a contemporary uh, digital context. But also, as you just highlighted in relation to the Gaia case, that actually um, resistance and feminist activism is often existing in the same spaces and at the same time as some of the problematic um, stereotypes around sexual violence that we might want to, to challenge. So my very final slide, I promise, is just some of the other issues that I think arise from this context. I've put ethical and legal challenges of researching violence and, and in contemporary media at the top here, because one of the things we had to struggle with in this book um, was how to deal with, say, survivor testimony on social media. And I think that's where those of us who are more used to working with legacy media, press, television and so on, um, maybe need to, to think a little bit more about what we do when a text that we might want to analyse is in the public domain, but is not necessarily part of a permanent record. So where, for instance, survivors have posted their own Me Too story, whether it's a vlog on YouTube, and we've got a great chapter dealing with those, or whether it's um, in a tweet, um, but they retain the capacity to remove that story. They, it, it's out there, but they may also still remove it and take it down. I think there's also questions increasingly emerging about the legal status of mediated speech about violence. In the collection, um, this is really nicely dealt with by Li Jun in her chapter on defamation cases in China and defamation being used by accused perpetrators increasingly to shut down survivor speech. Um, and that notion of the public survivor, I, I should have attributed to Tanya Sirisier, who's chapter in the collection is, is great, and um, I thoroughly recommend her work generally. I think as well we learn in this collection the importance of context. We have chapters dealing with more than 20 different national contexts, and as we've heard today, um, understanding national case studies in a national context, what are the laws governing what can and can't be said in Portugal, in Zimbabwe, wherever it might be, is really important. But it's also important because the histories of feminist activism in those spaces are also specific and we want to be able to engage with those contexts. I think that also points to the importance of connecting, whilst we respond to news, connect it to thinking historically and the legacy of feminist work, which, as we know, has been going on for a long time. I'm really heartened that your project is so centrally interdisciplinary because I think interdisciplinarity is essential in this work. In this collection, we similarly have colleagues drawn from media, criminology, sociology, law, social policy, international relations, and more, because I think that the theoretical frameworks we need don't just sit in one place, and neither does the interest in media. So one of the other questions we can then ask is what can our studies of media add to criminology, international relations, and more? Um, and finally, I want to commend the project for its focus on audience and on production contexts. When we were putting together the collection, we found that actually there is not as much work on audiences as we would like to see. Although we do have a really good chapter um, in this collection by colleagues Einar Thorson and Chindu Shudharan, who have been undertaking a project that in some ways sounds quite like yours in an Indian context. Um, but is also looking at production and at, um, at audiences, so offers hopefully an interesting model for you to look at. And then I just had as my last point that when we're thinking about this, we're thinking about the implications for researchers, for teachers and for practitioners. So I think 
certainly in a UK context, we're asked to think a lot about the impact of our research on industry and on professions. One of the industries or professions we should be thinking about the impact of our research on um, is our own context, how we conduct our research, what it means to our students, what it means to our own communities. So with that, um, I urge you all to order the book for your library when it comes out and um, I will finish there. Thank you very much.